So, welcome back, friends. Welcome to the online learning platform at Department of Civil Engineering. I'm Rajesh Gopinath, and uh, we are once again together on the course Occupational Health and Safety. So, in the previous session, we had understanding with respect to personal protective equipments, wherein we had a brief understanding with respect to protection of body parts such as your hand, your skin, your face, eyes, your feet, and of course, uh, protection of your auditory system and uh, also protection from falls. In today's presentation, we'll try to understand the concept of the potential hazard or threat or risk of infectious diseases which can originate or which can transmit in a given workplace. So this will be the flow of presentation wherein I shall introduce you to the various sources and then of course certain examples with respect to the diseases and pathogens and how we can go about controlling them with respect to uh, prevention and corrective measures and then I shall summarize and list the references for your kind perusal. So friends, uh, what we need to understand is whenever you speak about occupational health and safety, the prime concern always remains the safety of the employee because if your worker is unable to work, if your worker falls sick very often, very frequently, it would eventually result in absentism. Now, you know very well that if the absentism increases, then the production will decrease. Therefore, the well-being of an employee is directly proportional to the economic well-being of a country. Now, we have discussed various kinds of hazards and threats connected to your occupation. But in today's context, when we are speaking about diseases or occupational diseases rather, which can spread due to microorganisms, then what we need to understand is this is much more dynamic, much more dangerous and much more fast spreading than any other potential threats. For instance, if an employee trips and falls, he will only hurt himself, okay, most probably. If an employee's hand gets caught in a machine, he will end up hurting himself. But when you look at your biological diseases, potentially one employee who is not keeping well, one employee who is sick, he can pass on the disease to at least another hundreds and thousands. And when I say hundreds and thousands, I'm not restricting myself to the fellow employees or colleagues, but also to the other stakeholders, to the society and community at large. We need to also understand that as we are growing with urbanization, industrialization, okay, the mode of transportation has become much more developed. Now, we are able to travel greater distances in lesser time. The world has eventually become a smaller place. So, with, due to these developments, containing a biological disease can be tough and probably we are in the perfect example of COVID-19. Having said all this, you know, unfortunately or rather regrettably, what I would say uh, is one of the places where these biological diseases can rapidly spread is your workplace. Let us say you take an example of an educational institution, then the potential source would be the human resources who can be a teacher or a student, a faculty or a scholar. Similarly, any workplace which has so many employees, okay, at different levels, it is impossible that, you know, you can stop going to work. But if you go to work, then the hazard or the potential of spread is much more. And what we need to understand is in the world of safety, occupational safety, there are new threats which are emerging. As we are in the world of COVID-19, we know how the virus is mutating itself and, you know, developing new forms. The biggest difficulty when it comes to combating occupational hazards from a biological point of view is some of the workers may have symptoms while some other workers may not have symptoms yet both of these are carriers okay i'm sure most of you will be able to relate all this what i am speaking in the context of your novel coronavirus but what we need to understand is if a workplace if a place of employment 
if it turns to be a potential hub of spread of diseases what could be the reasons for that as you can see there could be various causes first and foremost if you do not use proper personal protective equipments secondly if you do not maintain proper hygienic and sanitary conditions thirdly if you do not have sufficient engineering controls fourthly if you are working in close quarters in other words there is lack of ventilation you are occupied yourself into a tight construction and above all if there is no focus or insight from the management towards the concern of the employee over production so these are the various factors in other words i am talking about the hierarchy of control so these are the various reasons why you know a place of employment can become a potential hub for spreading diseases and if actually all of these uh, factors needs to be understood to be improved upon if you want to make sure that diseases do not originate diseases do not spread please understand it's not always about correcting the issues the primary concern of any place of employment is to ensure that the di disease or the hazard does not originate itself that is preventive measures now friends when you speak about you know what are the potential sources when it comes to your microorganisms or in specific pathogens okay that is the disease causing organisms now you might transmit the disease by a direct contact or a indirect contact that is by coming in close proximity to another individual a person who is not keeping well if he comes in contact with a healthy person he can transmit the disease that is direct contact okay if there is no direct contact then probably the medium it could be water it could be the air that also can be a potential source through which the infections can be transmitted that is i'm talking about indirect contact now if you are talking about uh, let's say your covid-19 itself now direct contact is when a infectious infected person comes in closer proximity to a healthy person okay as a result of which the virus is transmitted from one host to the other host now the other way is probably there is a distance which has been maintained from the unhealthy person to the healthy person but the route of transmission or the path of transmission if that is not handled well then also your diseases may spread as you can see on the screen there are various ways in which you know the diseases can be transmitted okay it can be probably due to a fecal contamination it can also be due to sexual contact okay it could be due to blood transmission it could be also vertical that is from the mother to the embryo from the mother to the child and yes of course it can also be because of a unclean wound so friends please understand that there are many reasons many ways in which a pathogen can enter from one host to the other host so all these need to be understood so that we can handle them better and when i st stress upon this what we need to understand is it is probably a way of awareness that every employee and employer must have okay because a complete 360 degree approach to infectious diseases can help them not in not only in stopping the diseases from starting or also from the diseases from spreading this also gives them an overview of what should be the engineering controls what should be the ppe which should be in place now let's start with some examples with respect to your you know your biological diseases now please understand friends unfortunately some of these diseases are now looked upon as bio warfare okay so i have given you a list of nine diseases starting from anthrax to flu to of course uh, those which are transmitted via blood okay and of uh, yes towards the end we shall also have a brief understanding of what's actually you know happening today now when you speak about anthrax what you need to understand is as you can see on the screen okay basically this is a acute infectious disease now this is actually caused by a bacteria a spore forming bacteria which is called as bacillus anthracis you can see the same on your screen now if you need to uh, contract this disease 
then it usually happens when a individual when a human being comes in contact with an animal or a animal product which is infected with anthrax for instance let us say the occupation is livestock okay a shepherd a swine herd a person who takes care of cattle if that is the occupation then please think if a cow has been infected with anthrax then obviously the milk which you are taking out that also would be having the anthrax bacteria that is bacillus anthracis so please understand how it originates it all started from a cow okay it moves on to a dairy industry so just imagine how many people will get affected it is not just the workers who are tending to the cow but also to the workers who are working in the dairy industry okay so this is the potential threat of anthrax once upon a time used as a bio warfare in us now coming to avian flu i am sure you must have heard about this your avian influenza okay now this is a very highly contagious disease which is among birds now frankly speaking your avian flu is actually you know uh, in the present era in currently it is a epidemic which is mostly among the poultry okay especially in asia so among your hens and chickens especially in your poultry farms now despite the uncertainties you know uh, what happens is when such a flu originates the experts immediately you know give instructions that these birds needs to be culled or otherwise the risk of the spread of this avian flu cannot be stopped so again who are the people who are exposed to this kind of biological disease or infectious disease those people those workers who work in the sector of poultry farms in the area of livestock okay now moving forward your uh, blood borne pathogens now friends what we need to understand is uh, you know in this present era there was a you know a message which is going very viral during covid 19 wherein they said that all the temples have been shut down because god or gods are rather working in hospitals with a white uniform yes we are talking about the medical staffs see friends basically there are more than you know around 6 million workers who are working in the healthcare industries now it is not just the patients who are susceptible or prone to these kind of infectious diseases but even those medical care workers okay doctors nurses attendants these people also are potentially prone to these kind of diseases now we know very well that when you are speaking about blood borne pathogens uh, we can have examples such as your uh, hiv okay your that is your aids acquired immuno deficiency syndrome okay then you got your hepatitis b hepatitis c and much more so we have to be very careful here because we know that the spread basically happens through your biomedical waste through your syringes through your blood through your cotton swabs okay so this is again one potential source of a occupational uh, bio biological disease spread source now moving on to botulism i am sure most of us are not much aware of this or we not heard about this basically friends your cases of botulism is usually associated when you talk about consuming preserved foods okay however these uh, botulinum toxins are currently among the most common compounds which is actually explored by terrorists as a use of a biological weapon so if you have actually read the news probably there was also talk about the nerve toxin okay which can be provided through your food and it still remains untraceable so yes uh, botulism is connected with your food uh, processing industries now when you speak about the hanta virus again it depends on you know how hygienic or sanitary the conditions are i'm sure you can uh, visualize what is there on your left hand side and what is there on your right hand side friends the hanta viruses which you see on the right hand side they are actually transmitted to the humans or the homo sapiens okay from the droppings of mice or your rats okay 
let's say the dried drop, droppings, the urina or you know, urine sorry and the saliva. So if the mice and rat, those who are infected with this virus, from their droppings, these viruses are spread to the humans. Okay. Now, who are actually at risk of this? We know very well that, you know, there are labs in which uh, people do work with animals. Okay. Now, it could be your guinea pigs, it could be a white mice and so forth. So, usually laboratories where there are workers who are working with these kind of organisms or living beings, they are at an increased risk to these kind of diseases. However, not restricted to just uh, uh, the laboratory workers, but also under normal circumstances in extremely unhygienic, unsanitary places. Okay, then also there is a potential scope for this hantavirus to spread. Now, your Legionnaire's disease, friends, this is actually a bacterial disease and this is usually uh, connected with industries. Okay, mainly uh, cooler. Okay, so friends, basically your Legionnaire's disease is a bacterial disease wherein you tend to associate it with your water-based aerosols. That is, in other words, let us say any industry or any house, okay, which has a cooling towers or air conditioning systems or let us say portable water systems, if they have not been well maintained, in those circumstances, there is a very strong possibility that this bacteria may spread. Now, of course, this is something which I do not have to speak much because most of us have become well aware and knowledgeable with respect to the spread of novel coronavirus since the 2019. So, uh, I think probably a video will suffice. Let me show you a video. This is SARS-CoV-2. It belongs to the family of coronaviruses named for the crown-like spikes on their surfaces. SARS-CoV-2 can cause COVID-19, a contagious viral infection that attacks primarily your throat and lungs. What actually happens in your body when you contract the coronavirus? What exactly causes your body to develop pneumonia? And how would a vaccine work? The coronavirus must infect living cells in order to reproduce. Let's have a closer look. Inside the virus, genetic material contains the information to make more copies of itself. A protein shell provides a hard protective enclosure for the genetic material as the virus travels between the people it infects. An outer envelope allows the virus to infect cells by merging with the cell's outer membrane. Projecting from the envelope are spikes of protein molecules. Both a typical influenza virus and the new coronavirus use their spikes like a key to get inside a cell in your body, where it takes over the cell's internal machinery, repurposing it to build the components of new viruses. When an infected person talks, coughs, or sneezes, Droplets carrying the virus may land in your mouth or nose and then move into your lungs. Once inside your body, the virus comes in contact with cells in your throat, nose or lungs. One spike on the virus inserts into a receptor molecule on your healthy cell membrane like a key in a lock. This action allows the virus to get inside your cell. A typical flu virus would travel inside a sac made from your cell membrane to your cell's nucleus that houses all its genetic material. The coronavirus, on the other hand, doesn't need to enter the host cell nucleus. It can directly access parts of the host cell called ribosomes. Ribosomes use genetic information from the virus to make viral proteins, such as the spikes on the virus's surface. A packaging structure on your cell then carries the spikes in vesicles which merge with your cell's outer layer, the cell membrane. 
All the parts needed to create a new virus gather just beneath your cell's membrane. Then, a new virus begins to bud off from the cell's membrane. Now, with the virus spreading in your body, how can you develop pneumonia symptoms? For this, we'll have to look into your lungs. Each lung has separate sections called lobes. Normally, as you breathe, air moves freely through your trachea or windpipe, then through large tubes called bronchi, through smaller tubes called bronchioles, and finally into tiny sacs called alveoli. Your airways and alveoli are flexible and springy. When you breathe in, each air sac inflates like a small balloon. And when you exhale, the sacs deflate. Small blood vessels called capillaries surround your alveoli. Oxygen from the air you breathe passes into your capillaries, and then carbon dioxide from your body passes out of your capillaries into your alveoli so that your lungs can get rid of it when you exhale. Your airways catch most germs in the mucus that lines your trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. In a healthy body, hair-like cilia lining the tubes constantly push the mucus and germs out of your airways where you might expel them by coughing. Normally, cells of your immune system attack viruses and germs that make it past your mucus and cilia and enter your alveoli. However, if your immune system is weakened, like in the case of a coronavirus infection, the virus can overwhelm your immune cells and your bronchioles and alveoli become inflamed as your immune system attacks the multiplying viruses. The inflammation can cause your alveoli to fill with fluid, making it difficult for your body to get the oxygen it needs. You could develop lober pneumonia, where one lobe of your lungs is affected, or you could have bronchopneumonia that affects many areas of both lungs. Pneumonia may cause difficulty breathing, chest pain, coughing, fever and chills, confusion, headache, muscle pain, and fatigue. It can also lead to more serious complications Respiratory failure occurs when your breathing becomes so difficult that you need a machine called a ventilator to help you breathe. These are the machines that save lives and that medical device companies currently ramp up production for. Whether you would develop these symptoms depends on a lot of factors, such as your age and whether you already have an existing condition. While this all sounds scary, the push to develop a coronavirus vaccine is moving at high speed. Studies of other coronaviruses led most researchers to assume that people who have recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 infection could be protected from reinfection for a period of time. But that assumption needs to be backed by empirical evidence, and some studies suggest otherwise. There are several different approaches for a potential vaccine against the coronavirus. The basic idea is that you would get a shot that contains faint versions of the virus. The vaccine would expose your body to a version of the virus that is too weak to cause infection, but just strong enough to stimulate an immune response. Within a few weeks, cells in your immune system would make markers called antibodies, which would be specific for only the coronavirus, or specifically its spike protein. Antibodies then attach to the virus and prevent it from attaching to your cells. Your immune system then responds to signals from the antibodies by consuming and destroying the clumps of viruses. If you then catch the real virus at a later stage, your body would recognize it and destroy it. In other words, your immune system is now primed. Collecting evidence on whether this will be possible, safe, and effective is part of what's taking researchers so long to develop a vaccine. It's a race against time to develop a vaccine amid a pandemic. Each step in vaccine development usually takes months, if not years. An Ebola vaccine broke records by being ready in five years. The hope here is to develop one for the new coronavirus in a record-breaking 12 to 18 months. While all of this will take time, stay home if you can to protect the most vulnerable. And don't forget to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and as often as possible. This video was a collaboration between Nucleus Medical Media and the What If channel where... Perfect. So I believe that this video has given you a very good understanding with respect to what's actually transcribing the world today with respect to COVID-19. 
So friends, you know, towards the end of the video, he was speaking about Ebola virus, which took about five years to create a vaccine. Again, please do remember that Ebola uh, is also a potential virus, you know, that is actually your Ebola hemorrhagic fever, commonly called as Ebola virus. This also can happen through occupational, uh, you know, uh, reasons. That is if a person who actually has a virus, he can really spread it fast. Now, uh, what we need to understand is since we are in the era of uh, pandemic, okay, how can we go about uh, trying to handle this? How can we go about controlling it? Basically, there are two ways in which you can talk about restricting or correcting the uh, threat of infectious diseases at workplace. Now, first one being the preventive way, that is your infection prevention plan and secondly being your exposure control plan okay now having said this please do understand that both of them are equally important okay both these measures must be in place if you wish to combat any infectious disease now let's say for example if you're talking about your exposure control plan that is how we go about controlling the spread of the disease that is if there is a person who is infected how do we go about you know restricting it so let's say you know you have a policy in place wherein you have uh, guidance for employees guidance for workers guidance for the employers on what are the best practices i repeat exposure control plan is all about the best practices with respect to safe waste handling throughout the life cycle that is whether it's a hospital okay any workplace for that matter where there is a potential threat of these kind of diseases to spread so the plan or the contingency which should be in place with respect to the point of waste generation to the point of waste disposal or treatment now uh, having said this now let's try to understand with respect to your infection prevention plan so as i told you both of these have to be in place otherwise it's very difficult for us to restrict or protect ourselves from the diseases now when we say infection prevention that is how do we prevent the spread of the disease now i'm sure you know much better than me it's all about good hygiene all about good sanitary practices remember the video said you need to you know wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and however frequently you can okay so that is one of the good ways of preventing an infection from happening and of course you also need to understand that you need to have your personal protective equipments that is protecting your eyes okay let's say you uh, talk about gowns and masks uh, face shield goggles okay and uh, of course uh, you know uh, off the record what i would also suggest is a very good antiquities that is you know i am sure most of us have been taught in the school days or when we were young whenever we cough we need to cover our mouth okay uh, with a handkerchief or with your hand so all these all these will come a long way in controlling the uh, or preventing the spread of infectious diseases please understand one single plan will not work it always has to be the combination of infection prevention and exposure control if you have your preventive measures and the corrective measures in place only then you can overcome the spread of infectious diseases so friends today we had a brief idea with respect to the various uh, infectious diseases which can spread due to occupational channels okay and what we need to understand is since we speak about personal protective equipments we need to ensure that all these equipments are well preserved, well used, well disposed. Any uh, cracked or any torn personal protective equipment is as good as not using it. So these are the references for a kind perusal and uh, in the next subsequent presentation we shall try to understand what are the occupational risks or threats or hazards. Okay. and. Uh, we shall discuss about these uh, potential occupational risks, especially with respect to the sector of municipal solid waste management. All right. So now I uh, thank you for your kind patience and uh, now the forum is open for any questions or queries that you might have. If you have any questions, please do raise it now.